beaucoup. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I will now call the meeting to order. Welcome to meeting number 101 of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Public Accounts. Pursuant to the standing orders, members are attending in person in the room uh, and remotely using the Zoom application. A reminder that all comments today should be addressed through the chair. Conformément à l'article 183 du règlement. Pursuant to standing order 108 of the regulations the committee resumed consideration of report one arrive can refer to the committee on monday february 12th so we have a full house here uh, from the office of the auditor general karen hogan auditor general nice to see you thank you for being here uh andrew hayes deputy auditor general sammy hanouche uh principal uh, lucy Depré, director and from the public health agency of canada and again thank you all for being here uh today as well uh heather jeffrey president uh, Martin Crumans, Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, and Luc Brisebois, Acting Vice President, Health, Security, and Regional Operations. Uh, the two departments or the two agencies will each have five minutes. Uh, Ms. Hogan, Ms. Jeffrey, you have five minutes. I'll begin with the, uh, the Auditor General, and then we'll proceed to a round of questionings. Over to you, Ms. Hogan. Thank you. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Chair. Thank you for again inviting us to discuss our report on Arrive Can, which we released last week on the 12th of February. I would like to acknowledge that this hearing is taking place on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. The audit examined whether the Canada Border Services Agency, the Public Health Agency of Canada and Public Services and Procurement Canada managed all aspects of the Arrive Can application in a way that delivered value for money. I will focus my remarks today on the role played by the Public Health Agency of Canada. I stated last week, problems in ArriveCAN's design, implementation, oversight, and accountability began early on. Confusion between the Public Health Agency of Canada and the Canada Border Services Agency about their respective roles and responsibilities for the application led to an accountability void that persisted for close to a year and a half. Each believed that the other was responsible for establishing a governance structure and neither developed or implemented good project management practices, such as developing objectives and goals and budgets and cost estimates. It's not clear to me how you can responsibly manage spending without a budget or track progress without goals. The Public Health Agency of Canada was the business owner of ArriveCan until April 1st, 2022. At that date, ownership and responsibilities for ArriveCan were transferred permanently to the Canada Border, Canada Border Services Agency. In our view, the Public Health Agency, as the business owner, was responsible for establishing the governance structure. The deficiencies in the Public Health Agency of Canada's management of contracts contributed to our concerns about value for money. We found that the agency awarded a professional services tax authorization without using a non-competitive, oh, using, excuse me, a non-competitive approach. We found no documentation of the initial communications or the reasons why the agency did not consider or select other eligible contractors to carry out the work. Nous avons également constaté we also found that while the original contract included milestones with clear deliverables and pricing, it was later amended and replaced with less specific del deliverables to allow for more flexibility. In addition, the agency did not set out specific tasks, levels of effort and deliverables for those contracts in task authorizations. In support of transparency and accountability in the use of public funds, the Public Health Agency of Canada should fully document its interactions with potential contractors and the reasons for decisions made during non-competitive procurement processes. Mr. Chair, this concludes my opening remarks. We look forward to answering all questions from the committee. Thank you very much, Ms. Hogan.
five minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to appear before this committee today to discuss the report of the Auditor General and development of the ArriveCAN application. I'm pleased to join you from the uh, traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Martin Crimmins, Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of the Corporate Management Branch, and Luke Brisebois, Acting Vice President of the Health Security and Regional Operations Branch. Au nom de l'Agence de la Santé publique du Canada, on behalf of the Public Health Agency of Canada, I would like to thank the Auditor General and her team for their work. We welcome this report. The CAN app took place in the context of Canada's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Public Health Agency identified the need for an application of this nature stemming from the public health requirement to put measures in place to reduce the introduction and spread of COVID-19 and its variants into Canada. A series of border measures using emergency orders under the Quarantine Act required the collection of public health information from travelers. Initially, this information was collected using a paper form. Due to the volume of travelers entering Canada, the paper forms quickly became operationally inefficient, creating a significant backlog of data and contributing to traveler lineups at airports and border crossings. This made it difficult to fully administer the border measures while still ensuring essential tra travel and transit of people and critical goods. At the request of the Public Health Agency of Canada, the Canadian Border Services Agency developed an application to digitize this process. This was critical to Canada's ability to monitor, rapid monitor, rapidly assess, and respond to COVID-19 as it evolved. It allowed the Public Health Agency to better model COVID-19 spread, severity, and trends, to identify variants of concern and travelers from higher risk countries, and to initiate exemptions for essential workers. It informed border measures and subsequently facilitated the safe resumption of international travel. Bien que la verificatrice generale et... While the Auditor General concluded that the speed and quality of the information collected was greatly improved by the ArriveCAN application, the report outlined serious areas of concern in relation to the processes and controls around the application's development. Canada fully accepts the recommendation that the agency should document interactions with potential contractors as well as the reasons for decisions made during non-competitive procurement processes. We are strengthening our existing guidance and supporting tools and putting in place training with respect to these file documentation requirements. The recommendation directed to the agency also calls for a process to be put in place to ensure compliance with the requirements of contracting policies. The Public Health Agency is updating all of its quality assurance protocols to ensure that these requirements are fully and consistency, consistently met. Finally, the findings point to the importance of formally documenting roles and responsibilities at the outset of a project, rather than at a later stage, as was the case with the ArriveCAN application. We believe this finding to be particularly important in the context of emergency response and is being, it is being incorporated into our preparedness and contingency plans for future emergencies. Thank you, look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. I'll now turn to our first uh, our first questioner. Uh, Mr. Barrett, you have the floor for up to six minutes, please. The Auditor General said, and I quote, the Public Health Agency of Canada did not develop project object objectives and goals, budgets and cost estimates, assessments of resource needs or risk management activities. Ms. Jeffrey, did you develop a budget for ArriveCan? There was governance established around ArriveCAN, um, but it focused on the public health deliverables and the nature of the um, border measures that needed to be put in place and operationalized through the app. Okay, but there so was no there was no overall project budget established as as should have been the case in IT so no, projects. No budget. Was there a projection of the expected cost? Uh, there were uh, initial contracts put in place, but incrementally, as you're aware, those contracts were added to um, and were administered in, in sequence. So there was no overarching budget that covered those costs. Do you believe this failure to have a budget is the reason that the cost of this project ballooned to sixty mil at least $60 million for taxpayers? When we look at the situation in Canada in March 2020, um, it was a novel pandemic and the timelines and the nature of the response that would be required um, were not known. Do 
reviews on it quarterly or every six months, every year. Um, did that happen? The um, operations of the app were evaluated through a governance structure that included director general, ADM, and deputy management committees on border services. And we um, assessed the um, operational results of the app as we went. But the cost to Canadians was never included in a single review by your department. Is that correct? Uh, the documentation of the uh, cumulative cost was not a part of the documentation of that governance, correct? Who is the minister ultimately responsible for the Public Health Agency of Canada? The Public Health Agency of Canada is part of the health portfolio and reports to the Minister of Health, um, but the contracts that were put in place were and put in who place. Who was the Minister of Health that oversaw the development of the Arrive Can app? Um, the Arrive Can app was jointly uh, developed between the Public Health Agency and the Canadian Border Services Agency. Uh, during During the time that the Arrive Can app was first developed, who was the Minister of Health? Um, at the outset of the pandemic, Minister of Health was Minister Haidu. The Auditor General said your agency was responsible for setting the governance structure, which you referenced, which are the, the rules, procedures, and processes for Arrive Can. This was your duty at PHEC. That's correct? Yes. If PHEC is part of the health portfolio and the Minister of Health was Minister Haidu, then as the minister, she's responsible for this major failing. There, there, was, there was no good news in the Auditor General's report for, uh, for the government, for the Ministry of Health, or for the Public Health Agency of Canada in that report. So would you, do you recognize that this is a major failing, this, this $60 million boondoggle? Mr. Chair, we certainly recognize that um, the failure to put in place a formal project governance at the outset of this project led to um, inadequate oversight of the project and meant that the costs were not appropriately tracked uh, as they were developed. And we have put in place um, numerous measures uh, to ensure that this does not happen again. Um, it well, was a large public health emergency. Um, I, I would say that not only was there a failure uh, it, you know, it, it's not acceptable that they weren't tracked. The total cost, you know, is not acceptable. Initial estimates at $80,000 and ballooning to $60 million with uh, single source contracts and, you know, two guys in a basement being paid, you know, $20 million. Um, that's, these are failures. So the minister failed. The contracts that were put in place were um, administered um, by the department. So let me just be uh, the, very clear, Ms. Jeffrey. If this is a failure, who is accountable for departmental failures? Is the minister responsible for the what goes on in the department? As the deputy head of the organization. Who, do you, who um, does I the deputy head report to? Um, the deputy head reports uh, to the clerk of the Privy, Privy Council and to um, and to the minister, depending on the subject. And they to the minister that's being delegated to the minister. And the the authority and responsibilities are delegated from the minister. This is this is the minister's failure, and that's what's been evidenced in the reporting by the auditor general. You're spot on. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. I turn now to Mr. Chen. You have the floor for six minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The emergency orders required the Public Health Agency of Canada to collect contact and health information from travelers entering Canada uh, through the CBSA. We learned from the Auditor General that the report issued indicated that some resources who worked on subcontracts lacked the appropriate security clearance. As the public health agency, I would like to hear your thoughts on this. 
The uh, specific contracts that were put in place uh, were from the Canadian Border Services Agency and uh, a, a number of resources needed to be replaced given the length of the pandemic. Um, the, uh, the security and privacy considerations related to the data that was collected uh, were reviewed um, through numerous assessments, including from the Office of the Privacy Commissioner. And the uh, report was that the measures were uh, complied with privacy and were necessary and proportional to the tasks that needed to be implemented. In the Auditor General's uh, report in 2021, it stated that the quality of information collected, as well as how quickly uh, it was collected, improved over time with the ArriveCAN app. Understanding the urgency within the context of the global pandemic, uh, would you agree that the process of transferring from manual to digital base to collect contact and health information was needed? The process of digitizing the information being collected was necessary to have a functional border um, and to uh, facilitating the transit of uh, critical services, people and goods. Um, for example, in the initial days with paper processing, um, it could take up to uh, 14 days for data to be um, transferred uh, and processed. And that data was critical to informing the day-to-day -day, um, border measures, public health measures, and to providing data to our provincial and territorial counterparts for the administration of, of public health. Um, so uh, with the um, digitization of this data flow and the app, um, that uh, amount of time decreased to um, 48 hours on average. Um, so without, uh, without the app, um, it would have been impossible to manage the increase that we saw for in May 2020, where we had about 1,000 um, travelers a day, um, to uh, January 2023, where we were able to manage 50,000 travelers a day with processing time that uh, dropped from seven minutes per traveler to two minutes, uh, a really important difference at both air and land borders. Could you could you uh, share and enlighten us in respect to the move uh, from manual uh, paper-based to digital? Uh, a lot of digitization has happened uh, across government. Uh, is this something that uh, PIAC had uh, considered along with CBSA to uh, bring the manual uh, paper-based information uh, online uh, or to an app for collection prior to the pandemic? Um, I believe my CBSA uh, counterparts have commented on this, but um, a digital border is very important for the flow of people and goods um, in a modern economy. Um, so CBSA had indeed been considering um, the need to move to further digital processing at the border, um, but for the, with the um, layering of public health measures and the importance of the border in delaying um, the entry of variants and monitoring the flow of travelers and uh, of COVID-19 in, into Canada, it was really critical that those submissions be done in a digital way. So it, there was a very clear public health rationale for the need to move quickly in the development of the app. Um, by the end, we had 60.3 million digital submissions um, before uh, measures so were So my understanding around the, the, the time frame was that there was 47 days between the pandemic being declared to the launch of the Arrive Can app. Uh, has your department ever had to turn around a project this quickly uh, it, as it did with respect to going from manual to digital based? Um, this uh, was an unprecedented time um, and um, the speed of the response was really critical given the speed at which um, the virus uh, moves um, and the need to facilitate essential travel. Um, the, the Public Health Agency of Canada um, did not have uh, the expertise to develop uh, an app of this nature. Um, and for this reason, um, asked the Canadian Border Service Agency to work on the development of the application um, while the Public Health Agency focused on um, 
the analysis of the measures that needed to be put in place, the implementation of the Quarantine Act and the Orders of Council that really stood up the, um, the requirements that needed to operate at the border. Um, it was a collaborative partnership. We worked very closely together in the governance of th those arrangements. Given everything that's happened, the discussion that we are having today, the report from the Auditor General, uh, what what do you think is the biggest lesson that PIAC has learned from this experience that will help it uh, move forward and perhaps give Canadians some reassurance that the issues and recommendations identified by the AG are being taken seriously? It is clear um, that while this was an emergency that pointed to the need for us to rapidly develop tools that we did not have, um, that having in place the necessary governance with clear um, roles, responsibilities, and accountabilities, project budgets, and gating um, would have been um, as essential to ensure that there was adequate oversight of, of the development of this application from the outset. Um, as a result, we have put in place um, uh, specific measures in our planning for future emergencies and pandemics to ensure that that is a standard operating procedure. Um, and we are also taking measures to make sure that we have um, appropriate uh, tools, standard operating procedures and emergency responses um, that will um, allow um, us to train and ensure our personnel um, are able to deploy what were a wide range of new measures and tools that were required for COVID-19 in a more expedient way and to adapt them to future crises. Thank you very much. Suivant, c'est Madame Sinclair Degagné. Vous avez la parole pour six minutes, s'il vous plaît. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, witnesses, for being here for another session of interesting questions following the report tabled by the Auditor General. Ms. Jeffrey, on several occasions during your remarks and when responding to questions here, you talked about the fact that the pandemic was an urgent situation and as if it were an excuse to act fast. Here, we have a contract from Health Canada, contracts that were signed with GC strategies in January 2019, following a non-competitive process, the, the amount is 104,000. So we suppose that to go from one amount to another, there's the procurement process that should be respected. Could you provide us details with these types of contracts that PHAC or Health Canada had with GC strategies? And if so, why was GC strategies selected? for these contracts. Thank you very much for the question. I can assure you that the Public Health Agency of Canada did not sign any contracts with GC Strategies. Vous me never, you are confirming that it never happened, public health. For example, Mr. Crummins, what can you tell us when you are at the Treasury Board what can you tell us about any contracts that could have been signed with GC Strategies when you at the Treasury Board? As, so I'm not aware of any contracts that the Public Health Agency of Canada has entered into. Uh, and so I don't have details of contracts that they would have had with other departments or agencies. So you do not remember any such thing when you were at the Treasury Board? So when I was at the Treasury Board Secretariat, I was in the program sector presenting TV submissions to uh, Treasury Board ministers. I was not responsible for app development or contracting at that time. D'accord, donc uh, aucun souvenir, parfait. Very well, you don't remember anything. Okay, in that case, let's ask questions about the application COVID alert, what can you tell us about that application, COVID alert? So I can answer that. Um, the COVID alert app um, was developed as um, a, a tool to help limit the spread of COVID-19. Um, it was downloaded about 6.9 million times. Um, more than 58,000 users entered uh, keys into that app. 
the idea was that it would provide an extra tool um, to allow um, Canadians to identify when they might have been exposed uh, to COVID-19. Um, and um, the, um, the app uh, was eventually um, sunset and retired on the 4th of April, given possible de, de parler plus clairement. Could you please speak a bit louder and more clearly, please? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, the COVID alert app um, was a tool to help Canadians uh, monitor any potential contact or exposure that they had. It supplemented the contact tracing uh, uh, that provinces and territories and local public health had put in place. Um, the um, way the app worked was that one-time keys were generated when uh, people tested positive through a PCR test for COVID-19, and those that downloaded the app that had been in proximity to those individuals received notifications that they could have Question very simple. Est-ce que vous étiez, uh, donc la... Simple question. So, PHAC was responsible for this application. What was the responsibility of the different departments? The agency was not responsible for the COVID alert app, although we assisted in the development of the public health rationale and its functioning. Um, the um, COVID alert app uh, was, um, I, I believe, initially uh, developed by the uh, Treasury Board Secretariat um, and in conjunction with uh, Canadian Digital Services. <coughs> How much time do I have left, Mr. Chair? One minute, 20 seconds. Thank you. Could you tell us about something else? It's still very vague. The arrival of Mr. McDonald. He was transferred. I believe from the Canada Border Services Agency to Health Canada. He was in Health Canada. Yes. Well, let's let that go. Concerning the COVID alert application, you had a role to play in that application, which was not widely used. And I know that some contracts concerning COVID alert were attributed to GC strategies. Maybe it wasn't, maybe Health Canada was not directly responsible. If you were involved in any way in the management of that application, how come you were not aware of the fact that a contract was awarded to GC strategies to develop that application? But the public health agency was um, to uh, help to inform the development of the app and the public health objectives of its uh, development, namely to provide an additional tool for Canadians um, to um, have information to inform their risk management uh, related to COVID-19. Um, the um, evolution of the virus and the um, evolution of the testing methods being used in provinces and territories meant that once uh, PCR testing was no longer the main method of informing Canadians that they had tested positive for COVID, um, that the app um, became um, uh, of less utility. Excusez-moi, um, vous répondez pas à la question, je vous dis. I'm sorry, you're not answering the question. I'm saying that the contract was awarded to GC Strategies. I'm sorry, your, your, your time is up. Your six minutes are up already, Mr. Dejele. Sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I too want to thank the Auditor General again for being present with us on this important topic. One, I think the Auditor General has heard my comments in the past that I believe is a failure on three fronts. One, a failure to deliver good management. Two, a failure to deliver the best value for Canadian taxpayer dollar. And three, the generational failure and the consecutive failure of governments to finally address the critical underfunding of the public service that has created a vulnerability to which our public service then is forced to contract very expensive and risky management companies or app development companies in this case to continue on robbing the public purse. We see this time and time and time again. We've seen it in the Phoenix pay system. We've seen it double under the conservatives outsourcing. And here we're seeing finally the consequences of a dr drastic and dramatically underfunded public service. I want to turn our attention 
to the graph that's outlined in figure 1.2. In figure 1.2 on page seven of the Auditor General's report, it suggests that the Canada Border Service Agency continued to rely heavily on external resources to develop arrive can from April 2020 to March 2023. You can see there are many instances we're seeing it at, at least in some cases, the doubling of the cost that would be associated with development of these kinds of apps internally to the government versus the cost that is present to the government when looking at external contracts. These external contracts balloon dramatically. Look at the Phoenix pay system today in the in the billions of dollars originally contracted out by the conservatives. And we're still dealing with that that terrible decision today. And so now we're seeing the liberals continue in that tradition, continue to underfund our public service and continue to see what is the worst case scenario for Canadians. I also want to look at a very important fact that I think now that the Public Health Agency of Canada is present here today that I would like to point to. In the Auditor General's findings, it was found that there was actually uh, an instance where the Public Health Agency and the C Canadian Border Services actually undertook a process of jointly finding ways to develop this app. But what we found was in that process that they failed to actually come into an agreement of governance, an agreement of budget, an agreement of process, an agreement ultimately as to who was going to be overseeing and operating this project to the health, the president of the of the Public Health Agency of Canada. How could it have been for, for almost a year long that we seen no formal agreement between Public Health Agency of Canada and the Canadian Border Services in regards to governance? Can you explain why? Um, we've already um, acknowledged that um, that uh, it would have been um, appropriate and certainly in future, we will be putting in place formal governance. What I can say is- um, No, it's certainly inappropriate, President. It's it's inappropriate that this took place. It's not appropriate. I would, I would fail to use that word. I wanna understand why is it that the public health agency undertook a process that didn't involve the, uh, the appropriate level of good governance. It's established in the report that COVID-19 and the processes to which the Treasury Board undertook to waive some of the, to waive or to make more expedient the outputs of the government at this time were not acceptable, or is not an acceptable excuse to avoid good governance models. How is it again that the public health agency, knowing that fact that the well-established principle of the Treasury Board was able to come into an agreement with the Canadian Border Service Agency without a formal agreement on governance? Is this directly a failure? There was close collaboration between the Public Health Agency and the Canadian Border Services Agency in the elaboration and development of, uh, of, of ArriveCan. However, there was no formal project governments put in place and no documentation of those um, decisions, which the Auditor General has pointed out. We acknowledge that and we, um, we believe that that is a best practice that should be put in place in all future crises and we have taken steps to ensure that in all future responses, um, that this is part of our standard operating procedure and protocol. Whose decision was it to not create a formal governance structure? The um, intense nature of the collaboration and the development meant that these teams were meeting on a daily or even weekly basis. Um, there was no deliberate decision not to put in place a governance structure. Um, but if you're meeting that often, Ms. Jeffrey, you must understand the frustration Canadians have and members of parliament must have when present to a situation where you're meeting in a room every single week and you still fail to one, address the issues of cost, two, the issues of governance, and three, finally, the ability to actually come into an agreement that actually sees some of these issues having fair oversight, to me, seems like a very, very tenuous connection between what you think is good governance and what is truly poor governance. This is a dramatic failure, Ms. Jeffrey, and one that has cost Canadians millions of dollars. We cannot simply say that there was good intention between the CBSA and the Public Health Agency of Canada. They met every week, but failed to address the questions of governance and failed to address the, the questions of cost. If that's what you're saying is true, then that, that has to be the case, or we're led to believe that this lack of governance went unquestioned and the nature of these meetings were really not ones of governance. Which one is it? 
I would say that the nature of the meetings uh, at that time in March 2020 were focused on the uh, significant time pressure to um, develop an app that would allow the border to uh, permit the flow of critical people and goods. And so the operational outcomes were the overriding subject of conversation and the necessity of layering the public health measures. Unfortunately, uh, as we've acknowledged, there was not formal governance um, throughout that time. Um, and that lack of formal government. Do the minister know about the lack of formal uh, government? I'm afraid that is the time to digitally you will get another opportunity down the road. Thank you, Chair. Turning now to Mr. Brock, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you uh, to the witnesses for your attendance. I'd like to open with a comment. <clears throat> for the record, uh, spending under Justin Trudeau's government on outside consultants and contracts has more than doubled costing taxpayers $20 billion. And now we have a classic example of government waste and abusing the taxpayer. So I'm gonna focus my questions uh, to you, Ms. Jeffrey. Uh, you mentioned in the earlier rounds that uh, ultimately you report to Minister Haidu at the time during the implementation of the Arrive Can app. She was your direct minister. And you also reported to the PCO, the Privy Council Office. Is that correct? That's the, the role of the President of the Public Health Agency of Canada. Yeah. And directly reporting to the PCO is the clerk of the Privy Council is who you'd be reporting to. Correct? For the purposes of the administration of the public service. Right. But during the course of the Arrive Can implementation, uh, you are reporting to the Privy Council Office. And you are aware that the Privy Council Office literally acts as a Deputy Minister for the Prime Minister, is that correct? The, um, the Public Health Agency functions as part of a health portfolio. I'm not asking about that, ma'am. I'm asking you about the structure of the Privy Council Office. That's the question. And would you agree with me that that really acts as a Deputy Minister to the Prime Minister? Yes, that's one of the functions. Thank you. Now, I wanna know, without getting into specifics, I wanna know about all the contacts, whether they be telephone, whether they be email, whether they be in person, all the contacts that you had with both Minister Haidu and the clerk of the Privy Council during the implementation of the Arrive Can app. So, so how I, frequently, let's start with the Minister Haidu. How frequently were you consulting with her and informing her about the implementation of the app? So I would just clarify that it would be uh, the role of the president of the public health agency since I've been in the role for one year, so not me personally. However, um, the um, there was a... Um, uh, structured COVID governance focused on the measures that were being taken at the border. So here I want to distinguish. Again, this. I'm not talking, ma'am. The question is very specific. I'm not talking about content. I'm talking about frequency. So whether you were in the role as the president or the deputy minister at all relevant times or another colleague, um, how often were you consulting telephone, email, meetings with Minister Haidu during the implementation of the app, but specifically the 177 versions of the app is the question. Can you provide an answer to that, please? As it regards to the response to the COVID pandemic, um, the president of the public health agency would have been in very frequent contact. I can't give a specific number, um, but um, in terms of the overall health response, the orders in council that um, developed the measures at the border. Uh, there was uh, established governance that has been publicly Thank you. disclosed. Now let's move on to the PCO. Same question, frequency, how often? Uh, there were regular um, committees and governance structures that met about the COVID response. Okay. And clearly you were not sharing with either Minister Haidu or the clerk of the Privy Council all of the failings that the Auditor General has identified? Were you? 
the responsibility to put in place uh, the governing structure around the development of the app was. Were you, were you explaining to them about all the failings as identified by the Auditor General? Were you explaining to them that we have no contract, we have no budget? Were you giving some indication that this is really falling off the rails? Did you do that? We were briefing, um, I'm sure at the time, on the um, operational requirement to stand up a digitized mechanism. Did the minister, did the minister or the Privy Council, clerk of the Privy Council, ever ask you about costs? Yes or no? I was not in the role at the time, so I can't, um, I can't uh, speak to that specifically. Um, but I can say that uh, the um, development of the app and the time pressures and the operational requirements. Uh, it sounds to me, ma'am. That is that, the time, Mr. Brock. Thank I'm, you. I'm afraid. Uh, Ms. Khalid, a good day. You have the floor uh, for five minutes, you. please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the witnesses for, for being here today. Um, you know, I, I think I've, I've said this before uh, with, with other witnesses during committees um, that we've been able to question. I am very, very disappointed with how uh, this whole procurement process has happened um, and with a, a disregard, uh, in my opinion, for, for public uh, dollars, for, for taxpayer dollars uh, in how we conducted ourselves. Um, but I, I do want to get to the accountability piece of it. And I, I know that the conservatives are doing their thing, um, but I, I do want to put the, put the question to, uh, to our PHAC officials. Did the prime minister sign off on these contracts? These contracts were concluded um, at different levels in the public service. Did the prime minister sign off on them? No, the prime minister is not a signatory to these contracts. Was a minister a signatory to these contracts? No. So this, uh, this report uh, by the Auditor General, which is a really good report, I think, in terms of a wake-up call uh, to ensure that we are making sure that there's accountability for the dollars that we spend. Um, what steps do you think need to be taken to ensure that that uh, transparency and that accountability occurs uh, going forward? So both the Auditor General and the um Office of the Ombuds for Procurement have made a series of recommendations that are being fully implemented by the Public Health Agency. Um, on our part, we have put in place um, specific um, governance and operating procedures around uh, contracting in emergencies to ensure that uh, the lessons of this are incorporated into all future responses. We have stood up a contract review committee that is assessing contracts uh, to make sure we have consistency across our organization. We have put in place training uh, and um, new governance for quality assurance of contracts and to ensure the documentation is on file. Um, and uh, we uh, will be implementing all of the recommendations made by both of those offices um, in short order. Thank you, I really appreciate that. And with respect to, to this organization, GC Strategies, um, you know, in, uh, in December of, um, of last year, uh, our public accounts committee had uh, worked together to ensure that we are continuing to, to hold government to account, especially with this issue, um, and to make sure that we are doing right uh, by taxpayers' uh, dollars. Uh, we had put together a motion uh, in a very collaborative fashion to ensure that uh, that we move forward in a in a good way, and that uh, that we we are doing the work uh, with respect to that accountability uh, as much as we can. Um, it has come to light, um, like it, there was an article in um, Le Journal de Montréal um, last week, uh, which reported that the founders of GC Strategies received millions in contracts from the Harper government under the name uh, Corridor Systems Consulting. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, given that information uh, and to continue to, to add to the context of the work that we have already done on this, I uh, do have a motion that I am moving right now. Pursuant to the motion adopted on December 12, 2023, 
in relation to the committee's request for all contracts between a government department, agency, or crown corporations and GC strategies, um, Dalian and Coradix, that the committee expand this request to include all other companies incorporated by the co-founders of GC strategies. Chair, I really think that we need to get to the bottom of this. I think we need to understand what is happening here. And uh, I would really like to see us expanding our initial work. Um, I think this committee is doing very, very important work in um, in ensuring that, that we are um, getting to the bottom of how our taxpayer dollars are being spent, how efficient they are, and, and what we can do as a committee to ensure that, um, that we have a, an accountable, a fair and open and transparent procurement process and a way of um, of ensuring that we are spending taxpayer dollars with um, with efficiency and, uh, and and with care because I know that people are really hurting nowadays and and we must ensure that people have the trust in our public institutions to be able to pay their taxes and say yes we are running a good a fair a, a transparent country that is here to take care of our needs and yes during the pandemic sorry point of point of order chair just just hold hold, hold on a second um um mr Kil miss miss khalid um i was just going to cut you off i think you i think you were wrapping up and i hear what you're saying mr jenner just i'm going to come back to you i did see your hand along with mr Dejale, but just just give me a second everyone. i just want to consult with the clerk for a minute but thank you miss khalid appreciate it and we have your motion here in both official languages just give me one second Mr. Jennings, you had a point of order, and then I do have a speaking list, which which includes Mr. Desjardins and then yourself. Yeah, Chair, on a on a point of order, uh, the um, uh, this uh, is is an important motion to discuss. Notice was not provided by it, and I don't think it meets the matter at hand requirements. Uh, we are uh, undertaking a study at present of the Auditor General's report. Uh, we have the Auditor General and senior officials who have come before us to testify on that. Um, a look at uh, historic uh, contracts uh, from one of the same companies, uh, from, from not even the same, but from from some of the principals involved in the present company, um, is is just a very okay. different subject. Uh, so I I yeah. I believe that on that notice same should point of order, chair, just, just, and we'd have, be happy to discuss okay. it with proper notice. Yeah, just hold on. First of all, Mr. Dejali, did you have your hand up to speak to the motion or point of order? I have a point of order. All right, go ahead, if please. That's permissible. Yeah, go ahead, please. Thank you very much. I just looking for a copy of the notice provided both official languages before we debate or entertain that motion, please. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm going to uh, read it, Mr. Dijic. I don't know if we have an electronic copy coming right away to you, but I will. We will endeavor to get one to you. Uh, it says, um, uh, pursuant to the motion adopted on December 12, 2023, in relation to the committee's request for all contracts between a government department, agency, or crown corporations, NGC strategy, uh, Dalian, and Cordic, that the committee expand this request to include all other companies incorporated by the co-founders of GC strategies. And we will endeavor to get a, uh, copy to you and point all madame take the dignity no just attend on card chair uh, yes miss you had a point of order uh just on the point of order um from um mr uh, genuous uh, i do believe that this is very much 
uh, in line with what we are studying. We are trying to get to the bottom of how contracts are given out, who they're given out to. And it is very strange that a company changes its name and has been operating within uh, the, the whole uh, procurement uh, network uh, for the past uh, decade at least that we know of. I think this is very much in line with, um, with what our original motion was on this. And as you recall, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, over these past number of months, we've been talking about how we can um, you know, uh, get to the bottom of this. We've had these conversations. In fact, when uh, well, a number of times you've called special meetings, Chair, just to get to the bottom of this. And I think that this is going to add to um, where we go, where, where our accountability is, and to get to an understanding of what this organization is and why has it been able to operate uh, for so many years under different names, different contexts. And I, I think that it is incumbent on us as a committee to be able to add okay. to this ArriveCan study with um, with getting to know what this organization has been and what its history has been as well. Chair, sure, just to follow up on the point of order. All right, if I may. just briefly, Mr. Mr. Janus, please. Uh, yes, uh, Ms. Khaled is, is making arguments about uh, a study happening uh, at the Government Operations Committee. Here at the Public Accounts Committee, the study is, is Wait, no, on we're, we're, a, a report Sorry. on Okay, on okay, hold, stop yeah. both of you, please. It, this this is now entering into debates of the mayor of the motion, which I think uh, uh, are, are valid on, on both sides. Uh, I'm going to put this motion uh, aside uh, for now. I'm going to recognize that it has been tabled. Uh, I view it as tangential to this meeting, not in line with the business at hand, which is to, to discuss PHAC and its involvement. So, Ms. Khalid, while I look forward to having I'm this sorry, motion. Sir, I, oh, I Ms. 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 Khalid, Ms. Khalid, ahead. I have the floor now. I will allow point of orders after. I'm going to give you my ruling. We will pick this up. If members would like to use the 1064 and pick it up uh, on Thursday, I'm available for that or any time. Um, but this is outside the scope uh, of this meeting. This meeting is focused on business of the Arrive Can app, the report one with PHAC uh, officials. So that is my ruling today. I'm putting this aside. I'm happy to come back to you all Thursday or sooner if you like, although I think it takes 48 hours for a 106.4. Uh, but if I get even agreement from uh, other members, I'm happy to schedule a meeting for later uh, this, uh, this week. So. Uh, Ms. Clay, do you have a point of order to my, uh, to my ruling? Yes, I challenge your ruling, Chair. Okay. That then calls uh, a vote. And, Clerk, I'll turn that over to you. Just give us a second, please. <laughs> Shall the ruling of the chair be sustained? Ms. Bradford. No. Mr. Chen. No. Ms. Khalid. No. Ms. Diab. No. Ms. Yip. No. Mr. McCauley. Yes, please. Mr. Brock. Yes. Mr. Genuous. Yes. Madame St. Clair de Gagny. No. Mr. Desjardins. No. Sorry, clerk. Can you read the final results of that? Yes. No. I'm just I'm just consulting with with the clerk here on how I should proceed. But clerk, back to you, please. Seven nays, three yeas. So we are now debating uh, this motion. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how long it's going to take. So I'm going to ask our witnesses just to hold for uh, uh, a little bit. 
Uh, I do have a speaking order uh, already, which includes uh, Mr. Desjardins, Mr. Genuis, Pierre Presse, Madame C. Claude Gagné. Mr. Desjardins, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I do believe, given the context of my position and my statement in regards to the origin of this issue, I made and motivated my point very clearly just in the very first round and several times during this investigation already, pointing to the very direct instance where I believe the vulnerability of our public service that creates the kind of risk we're seeing in GC strategy is very relevant. I support this motion because of the intent to get to the bottom of how these individuals at GC Strategies were both, one, able to take advantage of our public service, not just once here, Mr. Chair, but several times. We've seen in the breaking of the story at La Presse in Quebec that there was over $250 million since 20, uh, since the beginning, since 2015. Now, prior to that, we're seeing over, in, from information I'm gathering from their former name titled Cordial, that they've already, they from the Conservatives, were able to contract over $7 million and that's just in our initial findings. It is true that there is a rot in the public service and that rot has been generational and I've been clear about that generational rot. And now what we're seeing is both the liberals and conservatives being true to what is the very fact of the vulnerability present to our, uh, present to our public service. I welcome the, the liberals uh, motion towards transparency and I invite my conservative colleagues who are also interested in uh, accountability and transparency to really delve deep in your own statements made many, many times about the risk that a GC strategies and players like them present to vote in favor of such a thing. Anything less would be a deflection and would be something to seek to try to hide what is the origin of the very important contractors on the other side of this. These contractors are known to the government, they are known to the Conservative Party, and they were known to the prior government under Harper. We need to get to the bottom of this. I welcome this level of transparency, and I hope that my colleagues do too. Thank you, Mr. Desjardins. <clears throat> Ms. Khalid, I'll just acknowledge, I see your hand up. You're, uh, you're now third on, on the list. Um, uh, Mr. Genius, you have the floor, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a couple very brief points. Uh, number one, I'm sorry to see um, what very much appear to be delay tactics from the Liberals. Uh, they don't want to hear from the Auditor General. They don't want to allow us to ask questions to the Public Health uh, Agency of, of, uh, of Canada. And that's why they're moving this motion in the middle of when we should be questioning witnesses. I'd like us to get back to questioning witnesses, uh, although a lot of things have been said by by uh, people in other parties that I don't think are are accurate. Uh, let's we're we're ready to pass this motion and 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 get it done with. Having had a couple minutes to look over it, there's there's nothing objectionable in getting this information. Um, I will just flag, of course, that. 2015 was when GC Strategies was was incorporated as a company. That's that's very clear. Uh, but look, if there's if there's a agreement to the committee now to pass this by unanimous consent, let's do that and get back to work. Uh, I'm I'm seeing a few head nods, uh, Mr. I, I see some, but I believe Mr. Desjardins, uh, Madame Secretary, I need to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to go first. We agree with the substance of the motion. However, there are two amendments that I would like to propose. The first amendment, instead of looking into the situation since January 2012, I don't know why that date was chosen. There are contracts that date back to 2007 with the two owners of GC strategies. So I think we could simply extend the date, we could say since the creation of their businesses, that's the first amendment I'm proposing. I would like a date since the creation of the businesses. For point of order and held off, so I'll hear from you, Andrew, Mr. Yeah. Shearer, because you were. Just in the, uh, in the copy of the motion that was distributed to members, there's a discrepancy between the English and the French. Mm -hmm. Um, in the English, it doesn't uh, have a start date. Yeah. And I believe my block colleague is trying to amend the start mm -hmm. date. So if we go by the English motion, then I don't think the amendment's necessary. Merci beaucoup. So, Mr. Duva, similar? Okay. If we remove the date, that's fine with me. Second. So we removed the date stating since the 1st of January 2012 in French. And the second, one moment, please. 
doing this in favor of this? I, I'm just going to check with Ms. Ms. Khalid here. It's her motion. Ms. Khalid, the, the, the wording is uh, different. Uh, are you agreeable to removing en français the um, uh, depuis le 1er janvier 2012 in English since January 1st, 2012? Um, could we strike that? I, I need to bring uh, the motions yeah, sure, into alignment. I think, I, I think that should be okay, Chair. Sure. Merci beaucoup. Okay, uh, I'm going to consider that uh, done. If I don't see any objections, alors madame, de votre deuxième amendement. Oui, donc une des raisons. One of the reasons why we did not receive any response concerning the motion of the 12th of December, two months later, it was because there was no deadline for the documents to be provided. So I would like that we add a date so that the government understand that it's urgent for them to provide the documents within reasonable time. So if you would allow me, I would like us to add that the documents should be provided following within the two weeks following adoption of the motion, within two weeks following adoption of the motion. Um, that amendment is um, perfectly. Sorry. Uh, just, just one sec, Ms. Kelly. I'm just going to. Uh, I just want to just make a, that that uh, um, uh, amendment is certainly well within order. Uh, I'm actually meeting with uh, the the the, uh, the clerk and the analyst later this week. We have been. I just want to correct, uh, clarify. We have been receiving uh, documents from the the government of Canada, uh, and they're in the process of being uh, cataloged and ensure uh, to, to ensure they're in a. Uh, uh, both languages as well and ready to be distributed. Uh, they're in a format to be distributed to to, to members. So I expect some of that to, to come um, uh, in, the, in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, Ms. Kelly, I think you indicated you'd like to speak to the amendment to your motion, which is to put a, uh, a two-week timeline on this return for documents. Um, sorry, so my understanding is um, that we've got the, the documents um, for February 2nd from uh, Public Safety. I'm just wondering if uh, we can ask for 30 days uh, rather than putting a, uh, a February 2nd uh, timeline on it. Can I just ask you, what, what is your, sorry, you mentioned another committee. What What's the relevance of that committee? Um, no, sorry, we had asked for documents, right? From uh, from public safety. Oh, I think and it was from a... uh, I think it was from OGO operations, government operations. Okay. All right. But I, I would I would appreciate that as we're trying to get documents in our committee, that we can give um, days instead of uh, as days instead of dates, if and, that makes and how sense. many you and you propose thirty days? I do, yes. Okay. In sous um, Madame Saint -Claude -Gagné, avez -vous... Ms. Saint -Claude Gagné, do you have any comments on that amendment, on that sub amendment? And I would like to note something. We have lots of break weeks during the next two weeks and 30 days. Go ahead. I accept the 30 days. Very well. Opposition to 30 days? All right, so 30 instead of two weeks. Now could I have a vote to pass the uh, amendments slash sub-amendment, uh, putting a 30-day deadline on this? I see thumbs going up. Any opposition? That is passed. So now the motion um, is, well, as it stands, with a 30-day deadline. Um, any opposition to this motion? I declare it passed. I'm now going to get back to our witnesses. Uh, Madame Saint Clair de Gagné, vous avez la parole pour deux minutes. Miss Saint Clair de Gagné, two minutes, 30 seconds. I want to thank the witnesses who are still here with us. You only have two minutes, 30 seconds. So let's not waste your time. My question goes to you, the Auditor General. In your report, and from memory, I think it was 
you said that you also observed that some processes at PHAG did not respect the requirements of PSPC when it came to codes for awarding contracts. And you said that KPMG had received contracts without a competitive process. We are not only talking about a non-competitive process that could happen, but there was no documentation explaining why K KPMG had been selected. And something else, the contracts had been amended to be more flexible. There were less task descriptions. So this allowed for the use of more public funds in the same contracts. Could you tell us more about that, please? That's a good summary of that paragraph. And I think it's paragraph 50 where we give the list of contracts and where the contracts were amend amended to provide for more flexibility. On the processes, sometimes this could happen. What I expected was that if the government needs more flexibility, it makes sure that in a contract, task authorizations are specified. This lack of detail is what contributed to the fact that it's difficult to know whether there was good value for money. I would say that these are basic requirements that we expect to see in contracts, things that should not be removed. How do you explain that, that basic requirements were not respected? As I said last week, I think it is because of the pandemic. People were under pressure to support Canadians quickly and, and efficiently. And there, were, there are lots of regulations that are required for government contracts, but we expect that some basic requirements should be followed. We don't have to complicate it, but there's a need for accountability. But you said that the pan pandemic should not justify uh, rules being thrown out of the window. We understand that things had to be done fast. We understand that it, this did not happen only during the pandemic with Arrive Can. It must have happened before the pandemic. Clearly, that doesn't fall directly within the scope of your report, but we want to suppose that, can we suppose that processes were always respected at all times? Well, it's possible that there were some deficiencies before the pandemic. If you look at the report by the ombudsperson looking into larger contracts, larger than arrive can at CBSC, clearly there was lack of documentation and some basic requirements were not respected. But I expect a government to use common sense and ensure that there's proper oversight of policies in place instead of simply adding the processes. Thank you very much. Two and a half minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I do want to turn our attention now to the Auditor General's reports finding under 1.42, page 11 of the English report. It states that vendors, under the title vendors, we found situations where agency employees were involved in the Arrive Can project, were invited by vendors to dinners and other activities. So the President of the Public Health Agency of Canada, do you or are you aware of any instances where uh, during your time there, during the before you were the president of the Treasury Board, or sorry, president of Public Health Agency, and during your time on the special task force for COVID-19 for the very same uh, project under ensuring that people had access to COVID-19 supports. Did you find any, any instances where this became a red flag and was that red flag reported? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we found no evidence that uh, agency employees or staff received invitation from vendors um, um, Thank you very much for that. To the Auditor General, what instances, or in your in your words, what uh, situations where the agency employees who were involved in the Arrive Can project were invited by vendors to dinners and other activities? What evidence do you have to suggest that? Um, we, we, as you know, because the files were so incomplete, we turned to um, emails, which are transitory typically in nature, and it's in those emails that we saw invitations from three or four vendors to 
um, at least five Canada Border Services Agency employees and about a half a dozen other that we couldn't tell if they were part of the Canada Border Service Agency or other departments because uh, their emails extensions were not there. And so, Ms. Hogan, just to clarify that statement, you're not certain as to whether or not officials outside of the Canadian Border Services Agency, which may include the Public Health Agency of Canada, were invited to such dinners or events? Uh, I am not certain. I can tell you that at least five of the employees on the emails that we saw, granted we did not see, you know, potentially see all of them, were Canada Border Services employees. And to the President of the Public Health Agency of Canada, in instances in your own uh, department where an employee is offered gifts or invitations to dinners, are they reported to you or who are they reported to? Um, where um, gifts are offered uh, to public servants, there is a reporting requirement and there are also conflict of interest declarations that can be filed, but I'll turn to uh, Martin Crummins to speak to the controls. So as part of the contracting process at the Public Health Agency, we have a form that requires all uh, all managers that are proposing a contract to declare any conflict of interest and that would be the the process that they would and thank uh, you i'm describe. afraid that is the time uh thank you chair turning now to mr genuous uh, you have the floor for five minutes please thank you chair what we've seen from liberals thus far in this testimony is is quite incredible they're trying to limit witness testimony by moving motions in the middle of their testimony. Uh, Liberals are also trying to question the core principle of ministerial accountability. They're trying to suggest that ministers are somehow not responsible for what happens in their department. Uh, and this is, is really unprecedented. I think it's, a, it's clear that in our system of government, ministers have been responsible for what happens in their departments for hundreds of years, but uniquely liberal ministers think they're not responsible for what happens under them. Uh, Ms. Jeffrey, I want to ask, Canadians I talk to are horrified and disgusted by what happened with the ArriveCan app. Do you think those feelings are justified? Uh, we acknowledge that the governance that should have been in place uh, for an IT project of this nature was- Sorry, so, sorry I'm, gonna, I'm gonna jump in. My time is tight. That, that wasn't my question, right? My, my question was Canadians are horrified and disgusted by what happened with this app. Do you think those feelings are justified? I think that there were many dimensions to the ArriveCan app. I think that there was value in terms of the uh, services that were provided. Sorry, do you, do you think Canadians that, are justified in feeling horrified and disgusted? I can't speak to how Canadians uh, view the app. I can speak to the governance and the project management that was put in place. Okay, that, that's a pretty clear non-answer, but we'll move on. Uh, there's a remarkable absence of documents, uh, including records of basic communications uh, that you would expect in a case like this. Did you or anyone else at the Public Health Agency of Canada destroy documents related to ArriveCan? I have no uh, knowledge or evidence of documents having been uh, destroyed, and uh, we have a policy that requires information of business value to be retained. So, so you can't say that they were, and you can't say that they weren't in terms of your own knowledge of documents being destroyed. Is that correct? I can say we found no evidence of documents have been destroyed. Okay, but there, but there was, there was such a glaring absence of documentation. Uh, are you concerned that documents may have been destroyed? Do you think it's plausible that absolutely no records were kept in so many of these cases? What I can say was it was a time of uh, great change at the agency as we responded to the pandemic. No, but people still have to talk to each other, right? I know. Ma'am, I, I, I know it was a, 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 an urgent situation and lots w was changing, but people still have to talk to each other. People still send emails back and forth. Uh, in, in times of urgency, there, I would expect there, there would still be a lot of communication happening, and yet there's, there's such an absence of, of information. Um, are, you, are you concerned about the destruction of documents, especially with reports uh, alleging Mindon destroying a large number of, of, of emails? And I know that wasn't PHAC, but... But are, are you concerned about destruction of documents within the Public Health Agency of Canada? I agree with what the Auditor General um, has uh, recommended, which is that uh, documentation needs to be provided and to be maintained on file so that when you have a uh, change in turnover and personnel, okay, that, that's, those that, records that, that's, are maintained. That, that, but that's not no really an answer to my question. Can I, can I just quickly flip over to the Auditor General? Um, if you can confirm your previous testimony, the complete absence of documents suggests that either th there was a, there was a conspicuous lack of records kept or the documents were destroyed, that one of those two things happened, but you weren't able to confirm which. Is that correct? 
when when documents don't exist, it's either they never existed or they they were destroyed. So, and in this case, we can't tell you which it was, but there is um, a glaring lack of documentation that should be maintained. Thank you. Back to the president. The app went through 177 different versions, most of which weren't properly tested. Uh, you you owned the app, so why weren't different versions of the app tested? Why did you not insist on proper testing of the app? Is it in their testimony that uh, the in order to increase the speed with by which the versions would be deployed, that uh, they were not all tested? So you were aware at the time that they weren't being tested and you were okay with that? The um, the governance around the project management at the time uh, looked at how the apps were being deployed. Um, and Sorry, I'm, 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 looking for, I'm looking for clear, ma'am, I have limited time and I'm looking I'm, for clear answers to I'm clear questions. I'm going to turn to my colleague, over, Luke Brisbois, no, from the Broder Services. Over, over, no, 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 I want to hear from PHAC. Over 10,000 people were falsely sent into quarantine because this app was, in most cases, not properly tested. Are you comfortable with that? And did you brief the minister about the lack of testing? So it's very regrettable. Um, we're obviously not comfortable when people are erroneously advised. In this case, when they arrived in the country, they were given a green check mark, which means they are cleared for entry without isolation periods. There was then an error in the app that resulted yeah. in messages being sent uh, out. The public okay, I, I'm asking about this. Genius, that is your you time. With the lack Mr. Genius, that is your time. Turning now to Ms. Yip, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you for coming. Um, as the pandemic evolved, the government uh, continued to introduce new emergency orders in council, and some of which required adjustments to the Arrive Can application. What were some of the adjustments that PHAC had to make? So there were many adjustments uh, throughout the course of the pandemic, with 83 different orders in council to be specific. One of the key ones was moving to a vaccine differentiated border um, to require proof of vaccination from people entering Canada. Um, in addition, there were requirements subsequently for testing at the border and there was a, a time when uh, the use of the app shifted from um, being voluntary to being mandatory. Um, each of the OICs was generally in place for a period of one month, and so therefore they needed to be renewed and they needed to adapt to the different situation um, that took place as we had successive waves of COVID-19 and the entry of different variants. For example, um, when uh, there were new variants um, detected uh, globally that we were concerned about, that were variants of international concern, um, we were able to use the app to, uh, to determine the travel history of those who had entered Canada to advise them to isolate. Were these adjustments handled in a timely manner? Uh, yes, uh, they, were, um, they were required to be very rapid. The entry into force of the Orders in Council under the Quarantine Act have precise uh, time. And so they have to be um, they have to be implemented um, exactly in line at the border with um, the legal force of those OICs. It was mentioned that PHAC, as a business owner, was focused on um, deliverables. What is meant by PHAC being a business owner, and how did that impact deliverables? So, as the business owner. Um, the public health agency uh, laid out the public health requirements um, for the apps. Um, the public health agency was responsible for making sure the appropriate privacy um, uh, protections were in place, making sure there were uh, legal and other broad policy coordination taking place. Uh, we had to define the priorities for the app. Um, we were um, responsible for maintaining the public health data storage and use and um, for providing uh, support to Canadians using the app via Services Canada. Can you take us back to the time when this app was being developed? Do you remember what the overarching feeling of the department was? Uh, what were you trying to accomplish? So um, in uh, March 2020, um, you'll recall there were um, border measures being put in place around the world. Um, Canadians um, were having trouble uh, moving abroad. Um, the, um, the, 
there was a need to find ways uh, to speed up um, the implementation of public health measures at the border. Um, the overriding importance at the time was placed on making sure that we had multi-layered public health measures in place and uh, the border was one of the points at which that was administered. Um, because of the need to ask additional questions and to have information on travelers, um, travel history and health, um, extra time was needed um, by border services officers to ask these questions. Um, this resulted in significant delays at the, at the border. And as we um, worked to, to try and find ways to streamline the entry of critical services, goods and people into Canada, it was very important that we move as quickly as possible to have a digital application that would allow us both to facilitate that, that necessary travel and at the same time to have the information we needed to model um, the behavior of the virus and the different um, pressures on epidemiology and public health that we were going to face to inform future measures. Um, so there was tremendous uh, time pressure and it was sort of an all hands on deck time when everyone was working as fast as we could to implement um, the operations. Do you think the creation of this app would have been handled differently if um, it wasn't in the midst of a global pandemic? Yeah, there is no question that we have very detailed and as the Auditor General mentioned, um, considerable overlay of uh, structures around procurement. Um, we have IT project gating under the Treasury Board. Um, while many of these requirements were waived given the necessary for the speed of an emergency response, um, it is also true that we were required to document those measures and uh, the Auditor General has pointed to the lack of documentation in this regard. Um, and that is um, something that we have now reinforced in our training policies and procedures, including in our emergency standard operating procedures and pandemic preparedness planning to ensure that this uh, does not happen again. Um, this was the first time um, we had faced a global pandemic in uh, the agency's history. And so uh, our processes and procedures have been continually evolving um, at, uh, after every crisis. And this one, um, produced a, quite a number of lessons in terms of our governance and our documentation. Thank you very much. That is the time. Turn now to Mr. Barrett. You have the floor for five minutes, please. Public Health gave a non-competitive professional services contract to KPMG. And on that, the Auditor General said, quote, we found no documentation of the initial communications or the reasons why the agency did not consider or select other eligible contractors to carry out the work, end quote. Is that correct, Ms. Hogan? Um, yes, you, you quoted the uh, part of my report, yes. <laughs> Ms. Jeffrey, how much was that contact for? Uh, the original contract was issued by PSPC as one of the seven uh, companies that were available under the COVID emergency professional services. The total amount um, that was, um, that was uh, contracted with KPNG through the three different contracts was uh, 4.5 million. Just the date, please. When was it completed? I'm going to turn to Martin Cremins to talk about the dates. Yes, the the initial contract uh, task authorization through PSPC was awarded and signed on September 29th, 2020 for a value of $518,000. What was the benefit the taxpayers got from this contract? The uh, role of... Um, of KPMG in, um, in, in this contract was really to uh, do the work to assess the, um, the industry impacts and the traveler journey using the app. So the app had to be deployed in an airport environment working with, um, with air services and the aerospace industry. And so they were looking at the process maps, at the journey maps, at okay. the rollout and other implementation um, around um, So this the contributed to the, the at least $60 million price tag, yes? Uh, the this auditor, contract? No, the, the $59 uh, million associated with the contract were related to the development of the app and its technology. So these were uh, Additional part of, costs. of support services related to border measures that, um, that included a wide variety of different measures at the border. So additional costs? Yes, these are additional costs related to the implementation of border measures. The Auditor General said that there was no documentation found um, on the initial communications on this contract. So who called who? 
the um, the contract uh, has a sole source justification on file that uh, identifies the expertise of the vendor in aerospace services, in uh, administering public health and health uh, projects at the municipal, so, provincial. And so local there are level. documents to support their selection. There is a sole source justification on file, but there uh, there is no documentation of the initial contact with the company. Okay, so who contacted who? Um, I. It's, it's Pretty straightforward. Either KPMG called you or you called KPMG. There's no documentation on the file. They were chosen from a list of pre-qualified contractors so that was KPMG. established by the, the public service, uh, by the by Procurement Services Canada, PSBC. So PSBC uh, KPMG. would have made the initial contacts with those companies. The Auditor General said, and I quote, them. while the first contract included milestones with clear deliverables and pricing, these were later amended and replaced with less specific deliver deliverables to allow for more flexibility. In addition, the agency did not set out specific tasks, levels of effort and deliverables for these contracts in task authorizations, end quote. Ms. Jeffrey, did public health reduce the deliverables required by KPMG, one of the largest firms in the world? Was there a reduction in the deliverables, yes or no? There was no reduction in the deliverables. Okay, uh, I'm going to uh, turn to the Auditor General. Um, Ma'am, your report says the opposite of what the president of the public health agency has just said. And I quote your, should I quote your report again? Or you, you've got, you, you know what you said. Okay. I can read it back to you. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, the, um, the, there were deliverables. The deliverables were then um, relaxed, right? right? They were very clear. And right. then they were, re they were made less specific in order to provide flexibility. Right. So, um, that's good about 40 questions, 40 seconds. Just oh. Okay, so um, we have the Auditor General. I read what she had written. She repeated what she wrote. What you said, uh, Ms. Jeffrey, is, is not consistent uh, with that. The requirements were relaxed of, by, of KPMG by Public Health, one of the largest uh, firms in the world at KPMG. How is it that the government sets specific criteria, then goes back and creates less specific criteria? So, like, I would want to know why the government would want to do that because we know what the result is going to be, higher costs for taxpayers and less accountability for Canadians. How can you possibly justify that? So, Mr. Chair, what I can say is there was no reduction in the amount of work that was required for the deliverables. Yes, the categories of the work that was being done were broadened, um, and the Auditor General has pointed out that that um, meant that they were less specific. However, uh, that was done in response to a rapidly evolving pandemic, for example. Which the Auditor the General also the... said was not an excuse and that, to Mr. relax Barrett, that is rules, your time, right? I'm afraid. Uh, turning now to Ms. Bradford, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the witnesses for being there today. Um, so, uh, Ms. Jeffrey, um, the Auditor General has indicated, and you have also identified, that there was no agreement um, between you, your agency, and uh, Canada Border Services Agency. And so there wasn't any framework or anything like that. Uh, do you have any idea why that was the case, that that was never established? I mean, we see the ramifications of that, but what are your thoughts as to why that never happened? Initially, it was PHAC that took the lead on this. So why would they not have been driving the ship on this? So the Auditor General has pointed to the, um, to the necessity of having this kind of specific governance in place. And I would say that uh, a letter of intent was established when the app was required to be mandatory in July 2021. Initially, um, we were working in close collaboration with the Canadian Border Service Agency at high speed, and at the time, a decision was not taken to, to slow that down to put in place the governance around it. Um, that is something that we very much regret and have corrected for our future pandemic preparedness and response. It is very important to ensure that the responsibilities, accountabilities are, um, are itemized very clearly, precisely to prevent the, the kind of situation that the Auditor General has pointed out where each department, um, I think, uh, assumed that the other was um, taking some of this governance and putting it in place. Uh, the Canadian Border Service Agency was responsible for the development of the app and the Public Health Agency of Canada was working to establish the public health 
uh, measures and guidance and border operations that need to be put in place and uh, the other corresponding policy, legal, privacy, and other structures around the apps deployment. Um, so while there was a de facto division of labor, that was not codified, and that is something that we have now corrected going forward. So um, has PHAC ever had to turn around a project as quickly as they did with the Arrive Can app when going from manual to digital base? And how long would such a transition normally be expected to take? So the public health agency has never had to um, undertake operations of this nature, including at the border. The pandemic required that response. Um, I can't say exactly how long it would take, but there is very uh, detailed and sequential governance around the development of IT projects, and it would normally take um, years uh, potentially to implement uh, longer term projects. In this case, they were undertaken on an emergency basis, um, but there still should have been documentation around that. But the reason, um, the reason that it went forward so quickly was um, because some of those processes were, um, were relaxed given the emergency uh, nature of the deliverables. Um, so uh, now to Ms. Hogan, um, has the major problem that you've encountered in this report uh, around the area of lax bookkeeping and record keeping practices in terms of the Arrive Canada app been of a similar instance in any previous reports that you've conducted? Have you encountered this laxness in any other reports? Um, well, I definitely my office has seen um, some, some similar failures in lack of a governance structure um, or accurate and timely information. I think it's easy to point to the Phoenix Pay system as an example of that. Uh, but when it comes to, uh, I think, failures at so many different layers, um, this is the first time that I have, have definitely, definitely seen, seen this. Um, I think it's it's more than contracting. It was contracting. It was project management. It was IT management. Um, it was bookkeeping. So I mean, there were so many layers here. Um, I guess the last comment I would make is that it's very common um, when we look at horizontal projects when more than one department is involved um, to see that the clarity of roles and responsibilities is often a contributing factor, or the lack of that clarity, I should say, is often a contributing factor to why certain horizontal initiatives are not well managed or delivered. So, um, you know, I would point those to some of the similarities. And do you believe that the poor bookkeeping and records stemmed from a lack of internal knowledge surrounding the project or from the high use of external contractors? I agree with the number of departments involved, that definitely complicates everything for sure. I mean, in this instance, if you're talking about the record keeping, I think it was the fact that, um, you know, many individuals, um, you know, di didn't seek, they had many opportunities to seek extra clarity and, and specificity, whether it be in a contract, in a task authorization, in, in reviewing uh, an invoice or the, or the timesheets that went with it. So I think there are many instances when um, clarity could have been sought, which would have improved record keeping. Um, when it comes to the other aspects, I think it speaks to the need to make it clear at the outset who's going to do what so that you have clarity around uh, who's going to be accountable for, for certain steps, whether they should be taken or not taken, and more importantly, accountable when it's all said and done to Canadians. And that is the time, Ms. Bradford. I'm at Madame Sekla de Gagné. Two minutes, 30 seconds, please. Ms. Sekla de Gagné, two minutes, 30 seconds. I'm back with the Auditor General. At the beginning of your report, and I would like to quote you, the agency had the functional responsibility to implement ArriveCan Arri till April 2022. So PHAC was aware of the fact that there were lots of contracts awarded and they had to know that contracts had been awarded. Did you find any documentation to highlight the fact that they were aware for example, that GC strategies had received about 130 contracts. Did you find any evidence on that? I think you've kind of broadened the question. Contracts awarded to a vendor that did not have anything to arrive can well on that, I don't have any comments. It was clear that at the beginning of the pandemic, the Public Health Agency of Canada had a lot to 
deal with. So the agency was very small in the past at that time. So they had to seek help from CBSC and they asked for help for the agency, asking for help to develop and implement an agency is not proper oversight. So we don't have any documentation. So there was no documentation, no oversight. I know you stated that there was no budget, no timetable, no deadlines, no basic control processes. You have no evidence, for example, and you talked about communication between PSPC and CBSC when it comes to the non-competitive process and so on. Were they the same exchanges when it comes to the scope of the non-competitive process? Was there any information whatsoever on PHAC? There were lots of committees that were in discussion, but as the president, testified they were talking more about health issues discussions that were necessary was not about oversight of the project or deadlines or cost so even though they were responsible for oversight they were neither responsible for the budget processes timetables or how the taxpayers money had to be used they had no concern to find out that kind of information. Maybe there was the concern about that, but there was no trace for any auditor to be able to check. I'm sorry, you have another turn. The floor for two and a half minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I wanna turn again to the report, page 15 in the English version under findings related to no governance structure or budget. The narrative we've heard so far and the one we've been investigating from the Auditor General, which we thank for her work, is the fact that on the onset of the development of Arrive Can, we've seen that there was no formal agreement existed between the Public Health Agency of Canada and the Border and the Canada Border Service Agency on their respective roles and responsibilities. We find that those roles and responsibilities are critically important because they delineate, of course, things like the project objectives, project goals, project budgets and cost estimates, assessment of resource need, and even risk management activities. This could have been avoided should there have been a good governance structure, at least to have given red flags to this. The president of the public health agency, you mentioned that there was weekly meetings to establish work of on arrive can but it failed to accommodate for any of these really important governance issues what was discussed uh if you can in just maybe 15 seconds in those meetings so at the meetings uh my understanding is the focus was on how to operationalize the oic's at the border through the app so they would go through the different releases um, they would look at readiness checklists for the releases. They, there was a formal intake process for any changes that would be made, made to the app and documentation of the business requirements for each change. So there was a lot of discussion around the operational rollout of the app and its different versions and adjustments. Um, but what the Auditor General has pointed to is that the overarching project governance uh, infrastructure was, was not in place or documented. Thank you. And, I, and I, I thank you for, for that statement because it seems as though that was known to the ministry, or sorry, to the department. Then a letter of intent was established between the agencies, and you mentioned that, to sign on July 2020 and was in effect till March 2022. The letter then clarifies the things that should have been done largely throughout those meetings. And so I was pleased to see that at one point there was a check and balance. We then find non-competitive contracts, however, are then distributed. It is a shame that upon the time that this was caught as an issue, that we almost see this burying of the facts by the release and tenureship of a competitive contract, but your agency was directly involved in ensuring that the experience and qualification requirements of those contracts were very narrow. How is it that that's fair for Canadians when, when so many times we see the abuse of these kinds of instances take place and we had an opportunity to rectify that by a competitive process, but then we've seen the terrible issue of ensuring that uh, your department... Mr. Digley, you're out of time. I'm going to allow for a response, though. Mr. Digley, you're out of Thank time, you. but uh, I'll, I will allow for a response, please. Uh, the decision was taken to enter into a sole source contract um, with KPMG because of the time pressures of needing to put in place the actual rollout in the airport processes, the need to liaise with airlines and, and uh, airport authorities, and the need to ensure that the traveler journey um, and the information that was being put out to the public about the app 
was accurate and timely. Um, so the sole source uh, was pursued for reasons of speed of response and the reasons for choosing KPMG were documented. Um, however, there, um, uh, the Auditor General has pointed the need for more documentation in that regard. Um, and so um, the, uh, the um, I would say the uh, subsequent um, contracts um, also stemmed from the experience and track record of excellent delivery of the vendor um, on those services. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shear. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today. You have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, question for Ms. Jeffrey. You indicated that of the 177 updates to the app, that, that test proper testing for the updates wasn't done. Do, do you believe that's acceptable to operate in that manner? Uh, a best practice would be to test all of the different applications. However, my understanding is a decision was taken to not to only test a sampling of them because of the uh, time that it took to test those and the pressure to have the um, adjustments rolled out quickly. Okay, uh, who made that decision? Um, I um, I don't know who made that decision at the time, but the um, well, who has the authority to make that decision? Decisions uh, don't just get made; they don't just appear. Who who? Who would normally have the authority to make that decision? The um, app development and rollout at that stage was being managed by the Canadian Border Services Agency, and the Public Health Agency was collaborating with them in terms of... Okay. So, um, so are you saying it was somebody at CBSA that would have made that decision? Or someone at... I believe Health? that CBSA has already addressed this in their previous testimony at this committee. So was it somebody in your department that made the decision? To not test the I'm going to turn to uh, Luke Brisbois from the Border Services Branch. Yeah, I think the president's right in the context that the governance would have been the place where these issues were discussed, but from an IT perspective. Nobody um, knows. We have all these officials who make decisions that impact people's yeah. lives, and nobody knows who makes decisions when we're going to, yeah, when the government's going to relax. I, th I think for the public health agency, the key issue was the dependency on the implementation of the OIC. So, so sorry, things had to like, be decided, and in the context of this, the, the, Every department uh, has IT an org chart with titles CBS. and with names. There's a lot of words going on, but like who normally has the authority to decide to relax rules or processes? With respect to the testing or the contracting? The testing. Yeah, the testing, we were providing uh, CBSA with the advice of what we needed in the application, and then we're running the process. Okay, so, so who would have the authority to suspend normal processes or relax rules? I think it would have been done through the governance um, of the DGs and the ADMs okay. at the time. We'd have to go back and take a look. Okay, the, uh, the, I'll move on. The 10,000 erroneous quarantine orders, uh, was that a specific event? Like, was there one glitch that created all of that? Or that was that cumulatively over time, 10,000 uh, wrongful quarantine notices were given out? So that was a specific event that was identified on the 28th of June and resolved on the 20th of July. So it was a specific um, event in the app, an error um, that was identified, rectified, and then we, um, the public health agency was involved in addressing that. Okay, with so it was one specific event. Did you brief the minister that this event happened? Uh, I was not uh, present at that time, so I can't actually speak to what briefing, but um, we can take that away. Okay, uh, were the 10,000... So, sorry, I just, uh, that, that's an open-ended. Um, um, are you going to get back to the committee when you say take it back? Is that, you're implying you're going to come back to us with an answer on that if the minister was, was brief? Because, Mr. Jeffrey, I will, I will remind you that you're here representing PHAC, so I know the questions are, are you, but the committee hopes you're responding for PHAC, and I heard you say you'll get back to, you'll come back to us. Are you going to provide us with, with an answer to that question? So I... I'm not aware of what briefing was done at that time, but I will. I take note of the request, and I will go back to see if there's evidence of what briefing. Thank took you, place and at that we time. will look for that answer. Appreciate it, Mr. Shear. You still have two minutes left. Have the 10,000 individuals been notified? The, the the Canadians who are ordered, or the travelers who are ordered to quarantine, have they been notified that they were wrongfully ordered to quarantine? Yes. Okay. Um, the decision to uh, pursue. The decision to, to pursue a, quote, non-competitive approach in all of this, who made that decision? Um, that decision would have been taken um, by the public health agency um, and uh, to take advantage of the, the contracting vehicle that was set up by PSPC. Yeah, individuals, um, to, though, like which individuals would have said, we're going to pursue this approach? Uh, I'll turn to Martin to 
for the who signed the authority? There would have been director generals and executive directors within our program branch. Can we get names and agency. titles? I, I don't have those with me at the time, but I can endeavor get back to, to the committee on that. Okay. Was the minister brief that a non-competitive approach would be taken in, uh, in, in uh, on this issue? Uh, the decision at the time was um, taken when the, within the public service at the director general. Is my re recollection of the signature of that contract? It would not be normal practice to to brief on the nature of how the operations were being um, implemented. Okay, so having taken a non-competitive or sole source approach to just you know not, not have any kind of comparisons, not do any kind of shopping around to see if you can get a better price or a better product, uh, who provided the oversight? monitoring the invoices that were coming in from GC Strategies? Oh, uh, the public health agency did not contract with GC Strategies. I thought you were referring to the KPMG contracts that were administered through the agency. So um, it would have been um, at CBSA. At CBSA. And, yes. Okay. We're monitoring those, those contracts related to the app development. Okay. Um, I think that's all I have. Thank you very much, Mr. Shear. Uh, you have a few seconds left. You did ask for some other information but i didn't um at about the one minute mark can you just i didn't i, I do like to get a, an acknowledgement yeah, it was, from, it, from witnesses bef and and, and the, uh, the the decision makers around the uh the decision to pursue a non-competitive approach uh we'd like to we would like to know who made that decision all right uh, on, on the kpmg uh, again if you can make yeah. note of that request and and provide an answer forthwith uh thank you i appreciate that mr Shear. uh turning out to mr chen you have the floor for five minutes please. Mr. Chair, we have heard today from PIAC that in the initial meetings with CBSA in March 2020, there was a lack of formal governance. The AG's report says that no formal agreement existed between the two departments for the next 15 months. No designated lead, no project objectives and goals, no budgets, no cost estimates, no risk management activities. This to me is beyond comprehension. Uh, section 1.63 of the AG's report, and I quote, a letter of intent between the agencies was signed in July 2021. That to me is 16 months late. In the real world, a letter of intent between two parties is what you start with. I'd like to hear from Piak on what took so long to get a letter of intent signed. So I can say that um, the the um, operas, operationalization of the app um, was done collaboratively between uh, the Public Health Agency and the Canadian Board of Services Agency. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we were very focused on the um, need to stand up the app and to have it rolled out to allow the border to, um, to flow and to have a, a safe restarting of the economy. Um, in addition to the flow of key people. Uh, there was a de facto management of the app go going forward that was not defined, um, and that is not a best practice, as the Auditor General has pointed out, and uh, steps have now been taken to rectify that going forward. The uh, letter of intent um, was uh, developed um, as the app was moving to uh, move from the voluntary use space to the mandatory space, and that, that triggered... Uh, a process to make sure that we had codified and documented the roles and responsibilities appropriately, which is a, a very detailed exercise that was then conducted. Um, and we acknowledge, recognize, and take as a, a lesson learned that that should be done at the outset of this development in future. Section 1.70 of the Auditor General's report says, I quote, we found similar issues in the two professional services contracts awarded by the PIAC to KPMG. While the first contract included milestones with clear de deliverables and pricing, these were later amended and replaced with less specific deliverables. I'd like to hear from PIAC, uh, why would you amend a contract that had clear deliverables and pricing to something that is less specific. That makes no sense to me. What What is the rationale for doing that? So I believe that the um, intent at the time was to ensure that we had enough flexibility to
adopt uh, the requirements to a virus that was changing very quickly and was requiring um, uh, some expanded um, responses um, that we needed to use the services of KPMG to help deliver. Um, the, um, uh, as you'll recall, at the time um, the, the contracts were initially entered into, we were not sure how long the pandemic would last. We did not know if there would be waves, if those waves would be seasonal. We were monitoring the entry of new variants. Um, and so initially there was not an expectation, I think on our part, that we would, were entering into many years of successive responses and that, that the, the, and the responses were being built incrementally. Um, so uh, I think in terms of uh, the need to ensure a continuity of high quality services, uh, the decision was taken to um, to add up some broader categories to the contract. Um, so we take uh, the Auditor General's finding and recommendation that that uh, is not a best practice and that we should be as specific as possible to ensure value for money. But I do believe that the um, that the the decision to um, create broader um, taskings was designed to allow for that agility and responsiveness in terms of the work that needed to be done. So I'm confused. Uh, on the one hand, there are initially clear deliverables, and that is in the context of of having milestones set out in the first contract. To me, milestones are broad goals of the work that needs to occur for the project. Uh, what you're saying is that the flexibility is needed because of the ever-changing needs uh, arising out of the ever-changing pandemic. Uh, but the Auditor General continues on and says that, in addition, and I quote, the agency did not set out specific task levels of effort and deliverables for these contracts in task authorizations. So on the one hand, I'm hearing from you that there is an awareness of what's happening around the world, and therefore you are acting uh, with uh, and, and and modifying the contract to reflect the the changing needs. But on the other hand, we're hearing that there's uh, the agency did not set out specific tasks, uh, levels of effort, and deliverables. Thank uh, you, I'd Mr. Like Chen. To hear, that that, that uh, is your time, auditor. but I will allow I will allow for an answer. But that, that is your time. C can I hear from the auditor general yeah, yes, on we, on? Oh, you'd like Oh, All right, sorry, Ms. Hogan, the questions for you, please. Um, so while I acknowledge that um, the public health agency um, right, rightfully needed to make the overarching contract more flexible given the evolving nature, that's where task authorizations then become really important to, to pull down across, off of this broader contract when you're asking for something specific. That's when you should be specific with a level of effort, who should be doing it and the skills that you need. And um, while, while flex, creating flexibility in one area still means that you need to provide some specificity for good accountability in another. Thank you very much. I'll turn now to Mr. Brock, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you, Chair. Since the release of the Auditor General report, all that we've heard from the Prime Minister and several ministers is that people need to take responsibility. They've essentially put up a firewall between the government and the federal public service, in particular, the agencies that are under fire. Now, to you, Ms. Hogan, the Auditor General, was part of your mandate, um, did it require you to uncover or ask for documentation to show what level of communication existed between the Prime Minister's office, the PCO, and various ministers that we've heard of today and their departments? So our mandate really is to look at how the federal public service uh, takes action and once a decision has been made uh, by, by a government. Uh, so in this case, the decision to enact certain border measures and then how was that op operationalized. Uh, in the course of doing it, not like that, we might often see briefing material or, or so on. Uh, in this case, because there was such thin documentation, I would tell you that we saw some emails where the deputy minister was being aware and made aware of things at the Canada Border Services Agency, but we saw no formal um, approval from the deputy there or no formal briefing to ministers. So I can't really speak on what happened between the deputy minister and a minister. Okay, focus. and that certainly applies to PHAC as well, that description you just gave? Uh, yes, we, we looked for it more at Canada Border Service Agency because they were doing the main contracting Correct. and development. Yes, But also PHAC. 
So, Ms. Jeffrey, I understand you've been in the role as Deputy Minister and President for just one year. Your predecessor, who was that? Uh, my predecessor was uh, Dr. Harpreet Kokar. Okay. And did you consult, for preparing for this particular committee hearing, did you consult with your predecessor on details surrounding the arrived hand? No, I did not. Okay. Was there a particular reason why you didn't? <laughs> Uh, because the uh, the public servants who are responsible for um, the administration of this project and the rollout of the app um, uh, and ultimately to have your, functions you, in the department. Sure, and, and ultimately you now, as the deputy minister and president, are responsible for the entire department. Yes. Right. So you're in a position to answer any and all questions. Yes. So going back to my earlier round about communications and the frequency, it sounds like. The minister, Minister Haidu in particular, the PCO who ultimately re reports to the prime minister were in regular contact with your predecessor and other officials within your department. Now, what I'd like you to produce to us, to this committee, and I'm going to ask it within perhaps 15 days or longer if the chair deems it appropriate, I'd like a calendar or some type of scheduling that would have existed at the time your predecessor was communicating to both Minister Haidu and the PCO. I want to know that frequency. You've indicated that it was fairly frequent. Could have been phone calls. It could have been emails. It could have been actual meetings. I'd like you to produce a schedule of all of those events. Will you do that? So there are formal. There was formal governance around the policy uh, of the border measures, and um, certainly we can document that. Um, but the decisions around the contracting and the governance. Of I'm the talking about your communications. You must have a some some type of system that documents when you're going to have a meeting with a minister. That's a pretty important event. You certainly don't just decide at a whim. I'm going to have a conversation. You don't document it. I'm asking for documentation to show the frequency of those meetings to Minister Haidu and the PCO. Will you provide that? Um, is there a particular time period that? Uh... I'm suggesting 15 days. I think Ms. Jeffrey means um, time period in terms of the, the. During the entire implementation of the ARRIVE Camp. There. Uh, there is, uh, there was a formal governance structure around COVID-19. Um, are you, uh, the sp specific governance structure around the app itself? Uh, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to seek clarification about what aspects of the COVID governance structure are being requested. I'll make it very, very clear. Any and all communications, whether they be telephone, whether they be email, whether they be in person, surely must have been recorded and documented. I'm asking for proof of that documentation during the entire course of the Arrive Can implementation. This was the most pressing issue in your department and to Canadians from coast to coast. Just to hold on, I might have a point of order, Mr. Is it point of order, Ms. Ship, or uh, yeah, is it the- Yeah, point of order. Yes. Uh, this is a really large production request. Um, so I'm I'm with you. I'm, I'm gonna let Mr. Brock um, uh, finish and then I'm going to interject to okay. try to I, I have the same concern you do yeah, Mr. Brock you've got about 15 seconds left um, I'm I'm going to try to help you get through this but uh, but why don't you finish up and then we'll we'll seek to resolve this so that's that's what I'm asking for what what type of documentation would have existed to record communications okay. between you you or your predecessor and Minister Haidu and the PCO okay just um, let me and uh, Ms. Yip, if I missed where you are, you can jump in, Ms. Yip, on a point of order. You're really looking for, I think, you don't want, um, to, to Ms. Yip's point, communications, you want to know when meetings took place between, yes, okay, so let's let's focus on that. You, you're, you kind of went out, it sounded like you wanted to go down the same path that Ms. Hogan had gone on by looking, looking through communications, which is very, very broad. You're talking about Timing. meetings and who attended them in the in the in the in departments that are involved? Um, you mentioned uh, CBSA, PHAC, and PCO. Correct. Okay, is that something you'd be able to provide? Be able to provide to the to the committee uh, the frequency of those meetings and when they when they occurred? Um, yes, the frequency of meetings that occurred uh, with CBSA, uh, Public Health Agency, and PCO in regard to the. The okay. Yes. I thank you. 
Is that, I'm, I'll turn to you, Mr. I just, you're good with that. That's yeah. No, no, so, don't expand it, but go ahead. No, no, no. I just want a clarification. I, Did that include Minister Haidu and the PCO? Uh, your description? Uh, P, uh, well, uh, okay. So PCO was, was mentioned. Um, ministerial would be uh, uh, different. So I'm going to let you come back to that because you guys have another, you're, you have another round. We have agreement on this. Ms. Mm -hmm. Yip, there is agreement, but you have the floor and a point of order if you like. And then I'm going to turn to, you will have the floor after your point of order. Okay. So, um, well, first of all. Is this point of order? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is a lot of production um, documents. Ms. Yip, I will stop. The witness has agreed to provide the documents. Normally the committee looks for an answer uh, in about in about two weeks, at which point we begin to make inquiries. But it has been, uh, it has been, uh, agreed to mm -hmm. from 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 the minister. So, uh, pardon me from the from the from the witness. So, I need to know what your point of order is. Oh, well, it would have been better if we could have had this discussion as a committee. Well, okay, Ms. Yip, you now have the floor for five minutes. Over to you. Okay. Do we? Okay, we are over the time at twelve. Uh, we are not yet over the time. We started late, and we're still going through it. And it is my intention to get through the full round, which will give uh, our colleagues, the Bloc and the NDP, uh, time ap after you as well. Then we'll wrap things up in the normal round. Okay. Um, although the Auditor General only made one recommendation uh, to PHAC, I'd still like to know if there are any current action plans. What is happening right now? Um, for example, um, at 1.47, PIAC has stated it will update guidance or checklists with respect to file documentation, uh, noting requirements to document interactions with potential contractors. What progress can you report on this? Um, so uh, both the recommendations that were made by the um, procurement ombuds um, will be um, completed um, by next month and are on track. Um, we have taken steps to um, codify the need for IT project governance as part of our emergency preparedness planning. Um, we uh, have stood up a uh, contract management committee um, that will have oversight uh, across the agency of all contracts. And we have renewed our training and checklists in terms of the documentation that needs to be provided um, for contracting uh, and are reinforcing um, the requirements of the directives uh, across the agency. So, um, so how will these requirements be actually monitored and enforced? So the, the training of our staff um, can be tracked. Uh, we will have regular reporting requirements and um, there will continue to be um, internal controls exercised uh, reviewing and sampling contracts. Okay. Um, and so there is also um, a review of the current process in place to ensure compliance with file documentation as per Treasury Board directives on the management of procurement um, by October 31st, 2024. Why will it take the agency over seven months to verify that its practices are compliant with the uh, directive? So uh, what we had hoped to accomplish by that time is the regular sampling and testing uh, to make sure that the, um, the uh, documentation has been um, taking place in the normal course of business on contracts that we're entering into. So that is um, a requirement by which I will have tested the effective implementation of the measures. So how close are you to um, this directive in terms of completing? Um, well, the um, the requirements are in place as of now, and so we are going to be doing further review and training to make sure that given the number of new staff that have joined the agency um, through the pandemic years have the same level of, uh, of training and, um, and um, comfort with the directives, and then we are going to be monitoring and verifying compliance with the implementation. Um, my Last question to the Auditor General. After hearing all these questions and testimonies, is there anything else you would add for PHAC? 
I mean, if I was looking at um, going forward, uh, what I'd like to see some of the departments um, and agencies do is think think about um, how to find a way when it comes to IT procurement to upskill public service. Um, you, you know, so that while you might turn to a contractor to uh, get a skill that you don't need to employ. Um, uh, every 365 days a year, you still need to worry about upskilling the public service to be more digital. Uh, in that vein, I would encourage um, departments and agencies to think about things that might, might need to be digitized, things that are normally done um, on paper and so that we're not doing it in an emergency because the, the need to react quickly um, sh shouldn't shouldn't be used as a, as a reason not to follow good procurement rules, good project management practices, and definitely good financial record keeping. Thank you. Thank you, Monsieur. Uh, Madame Sekla Degangi, vous avez parole pour deux minutes trente secondes, s'il vous plaît. You have two minutes, 30 seconds. Thank you, Chair. I would like to continue my line of questioning started before. I was uneasy hearing you talk about the size of the public service because even if it's a small organization, there are hundreds of SMEs in the country that are able to prepare a budget with 300, 300 employees and are able to follow up what they're doing. We do agree that the size of the Public Health Agency of Can Canada did not justify the fact that there was no budget, no follow up or that no questions were asked about the development of the application and about who. So your question was because you asked why, and then when I was answering, I talked about the size. I do agree that all these circumstances are just what it is, circumstances. We still need accountability. And the Treasury Board Secretary, Secretary did give the right guidance to the public service to be more flexible, do things quickly, but still ensure accountability. So why were those recommendations from the Treasury Board not respected? That's a question you should put to the department and to those concerned. Ms. Jeffrey, concretely, you've just heard what we said. I said that SMEs are able to prepare a budget, ensure oversight, and even follow treasury board uh, recommendations was this mere negligence or was there a desire to simply look the other way in the face of a global pandemic with multiple lines of operation across borders vaccine procurement therapeutics uh, and all the other aspects of public health response meant that insufficient attention was paid to the governance structure of this project which we regret and which we have undertaken to rectify in future Trans to go on the card. 30 seconds left. Very well. I think I've had enough. Thank you. Thank you. You have the floor for two and a half minutes. Over to you, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I do want to now turn again to the last question I left off on, which was in relation to the non-competitive and the competitive process that was undertaken by the Public Health Agency of Canada in regards to GC strategies and KPMG. President of the Public Health Agency of Canada, you mentioned that the KPMG was selected amongst a list of vendors that was known to the agency as to the qualification, qualification reasons given in answering my question as to why that agency was selected. You responded that it was a, because of a list of known contractors can you supply that list of known contractors and when those known contractors were added to that list, in addition to how long that list has been operating? Uh, this was a, a global professional services procurement vehicle established by um, PSPC, um, and they established the contracts with each of the seven vendors. Um, uh, Could you provide that to this committee, please? Uh, yes. Thank you very much. And can you also, in addition to that, add the date to which those companies were added to that list? Um, this is uh, probably a question that I would suggest you ask our uh, PSPC officials who I believe are appearing uh, tomorrow in front of this committee. The Public Service uh, Agency of Canada was not involved in establishing the list. 
thank you for that. It does. I do appreciate the recommendation. However, it doesn't devoid your ministry of or department of accountability when it was your department that was uh, the business owner of this project, and you should have asked those questions uh, to the Public Service Agency of Canada before operating those contracts. And so, my final question is in relation to moving forward in terms of the Public Health Agency of Canada's operational work in regards to how it will manage future contracts. I think it's unfortunate that the Auditor General had to recommend such basic levels of qualification for good governance. And I would say those basic levels of qualification uh, are important for me to ask now that you commit to the uh, findings of the Auditor General. And would you also submit to the fact of following up with us in one year's time as to how you've implemented these recommendations of the Auditor General? Uh, we have regular reporting requirements and we will be reporting back on the management response to the Auditor General's report. And do you have any last, uh, I'll give you 10 seconds just remaining um, for any final comments you may have to this committee. Um, so uh, my my final comment is uh, that I um, would welcome the findings of the Auditor General's report that um, while it was an unprecedented emergency response to a global pandemic that had not been faced before by the agency, uh, there were severe operational requirements for urgent response. Um, there nonetheless um, is a requirement to document and to have in place governance. We have taken that lesson and while uh, I'm very proud of the response of the agency in terms of the services delivered to Canadians and in terms of protecting health and safety through the delivery of border services, uh, vaccines, therapeutics and other critical public health elements of the response. Um, we uh, can and will do better in terms of the governance put in place around these projects in the future going forward. As thank well you, as witnesses, and thank, thank you, you, Chair. Thank you all very much. Uh, Mr. Brock, you have the floor for five minutes. Scam boondoggle has to have consequences. It's little comfort to the Canadians who are watching this that you're going to do better the next time, that this pandemic was a once-in-a-lifetime uh, issue. You had all the structures in place, and you failed to follow through. Your agency, the CBSA, PSPC, consequences. Apart from Cameron McDonald and Antonio Utano, have you suspended, with or without pay, any of your employees involved in this scandal? Yes or no? No, there have been no findings of doing our investigations into Public Health Agency of Canada employees, and no employees have been suspended. Right. You can only imagine the Canadian taxpayer who are going right now through organizing their taxes, Canadian businesses. Point of, point of order, Mr. Chair? Yes, Ms. Khalid. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm just trying to figure out how long we are going. On, uh, we have this meeting. Yeah, I, uh, I, I we, do we, have other obligations. Yeah, I, I, I'll entry. We, uh, we, uh, we, Mr. Brock and then Miss Bradford, and then we'll end it for the day. Okay, thank you so very much. Appreciate that. And you, Brock, and you, you have, have a classic minutes. example how the Liberals want to deflect attention away from this. Point of order so again, Canadian Mr. Chair. Okay, I hold. was just trying to. I was trying to get clarification. I have other things going on throughout my day to support my constituents. I am so sorry. I don't like to be blamed by the Conservatives for just trying right. to get to my constituents th th with thank, a sham thank you. meeting that the, we have had right now. All right, Ms. Clid, thank you. Uh, Mr. Brock, you have the floor for four minutes, please. Businesses and taxpayers are going through the tax process right now. One can only imagine the consequences to taxpayers and Canadian business owners for the shoddy way that your agency, the CBSA, and the PSPC documented their affairs. There would be consequences. The CRA would be levying consequences, if not calling in the authorities to potentially charge individuals. And all I'm hearing is, sorry, we'll do better. That's not good enough. Someone's got to take responsibility. It's clear you, ma'am, as a deputy minister and the president, have to assume responsibility. You suspended nobody other than Cameron McDonald and Mr. Utano for speaking truth to power. Ultimately, the responsibility lies with this government. Minister Haidu, Minister Blair, 
are all responsible for falling asleep Point at the wheel. Chair. And the Prime Minister point is the order, ultimate chair. person Just who's one responsible. Second, Mr. Order, Roddus. Ms. Khalid, what's the point of order? Um, I'm not really sure why we are naming ministers without having any evidence or proof and blaming Ms. them for Ms. Khalid, this is not a point of order. Uh, there's a thing called ministerial responsibility in this country. You're well versed in it. As to your previous point of order, you can ask your whip or your committee chair, vice chair, where we are in the rotation. Ms. Yip had asked not 15 minutes ago when we were ending it. I was going to, and I told her. So your previous point of order did look like it was interrupting Mr. Brock, as did this one needlessly. Mr. Brock, you have the floor for three minutes. You keep interesting, interrupting Mr. Brock. I'm going to keep adding time to him so he can collect his thoughts and begin anew. Three minutes, sir. You see, Ms. Jeffrey, I won't be silenced. I speak on behalf of Canadians who demand the truth. Do you agree with me that the ministers and the prime minister need to step up and accept responsibility for this mess? Yes or no? The governance of the Arrive Cam project was managed uh, within the public service. And as deputy head of the public health agency, I take responsibility for its management. Ceding my time to my colleague, Mr. McCauley. Thanks. Uh, Ms. Jeffrey, you made a comment that it seemed to state that the, government, the lack of governance was because of everything going on with procuring vaccines, therapies, and COVID, the um, issues around COVID. But earlier, twice you stated it was a decision to relax the governance. So which is it? Is it, as you stated that, it was a specific decision made to relax the governance on this, or was it something else? So just to clarify, um, I did not say it was a decision not to, to relax the governance. I said that uh, the more flexible uh, terms of the uh, contract with KPMG were designed to we, provide we, flexibility. This was about the entire governance, the governance not structure. specifically KPMG, it was about the entire governance of the ArriveCam process. In he fact, the twice, there was a relaxation of the governance. Mr. Chair, there was not a relaxation of the governance. Uh, I acknowledge that the governance was not documented or put in place from the outside of the project. However, that was rectified later as the project so was implemented. You're twice referencing and more relaxing governance was in reference to what? I was speaking to the um, the uh, specific task that the Auditor General referenced in terms of the KPMG contract that she who believed that, should have had more precise milestones. to relax the governance on that specific issue? To be clear, Mr. Chair, there was no decision to relax the governance around the uh, RiveCan app. It was an oversight that was later rectified in you terms of the- specifically stated three times relaxation of governance. Who made the decision to relax that governance? Uh, Mr. Chair, I did not believe I spoke to the relaxation of the governance, and certainly there was no you decision that I'm aware of to relax the governance of the project. There were 30 seconds, Mr. McCall. Okay. The 177 updates to ArriveCan, who made those decisions to make those 177 updates? Were they driven by Order and Council? Were they driven by PHAC? Um, the the majority of the updates were driven by the changes to the order in council as a result of the need to evolve and change the border measures uh, under the quarantine act as a result of the evolution of the virus and the public health situation inside canada so and mostly driven by oic or mostly driven by orders in council yes the orders in council drove the changes to the app Thank you very much. That is your time. Uh, finally, now to close it out, Ms. Bradford, you have the floor for up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, question for the Auditor General. You determined that the government did not obtain the best value for money in procuring the Arrive Can application. What factors did you consider in coming to this conclusion? Um, so there, there were um, many factors. I think I will, I'll list off just three uh, quickly. One would be the continued reliance on an external vendor over time, uh, when um, that that is more costly than having uh, the public service do some of the work. So we would have expected that some something would have transitioned at some point to the public service. Uh, the second uh, would have been that many of the contracts that we saw uh, around uh, GC strategy and some of the other vendors 
uh, consistently required the highest level of IT experience. So that le- that experience being 10 years or more, um, when uh, there was never a, a good justification for why that was always the level of experience needed. So you would have expected normally in a development project to see many different layers, uh, levels of IT experience uh, being needed. And I think finally, I would point to um, contract extensions, uh, multiple ones that we saw where uh, the dollar value was increased and very very few instances where deliverables were expanded. So all of those um, contributed um, amongst other factors to why we believe that uh, the government did not get the best value for money and ultimately uh, paid too much for the Arrive Can application. Now, did you look into any other comparable projects in other jurisdictions? Um, No, we didn't set out to look at what other uh, countries may have done when it came to similar types of apps to control their border measures. Border measures were very different in different countries um, or or may have changed at different times. And uh, we felt that it was important to focus on what the public service here was doing. So getting back to the fact that uh, they continue to use outside sources when maybe perhaps they could have you know, migrated to internal uh, um, employees to reduce the cost and get better value for money? Yes, Mr. Genuous, point of order, please. Thank you, Chair. I wanted to review the record before before raising this. Uh, This is a very important meeting we're having with the Auditor General. Ms. Callie, during one of her uh, points of order, so-called interventions, referred to it as a sham meeting. I think that's unparliamentary language and I'm not sure why she considers this important meeting. No, uh, okay, Ms. Mr. Genuous, I, I, I no, no, okay, Ms. I would like to get back to Ms. Bradford. Uh, I, I, I'm more than I, happy to comment let's, about this, Mr. Let's, Chair. Uh, no, I am, I, uh, I do not need you to comment. You and I both know, Mr. Chair, this meeting could have happened last week and not during a constituency week. Well, oh, really? Well, uh, I, it, uh, that is probably not true, uh, Ms. Kelly, since the report just came down. I'd like to get back to Ms. Ms. Bradford. If government members have an issue coming in on a recess week, they can speak to their whip and seek reassignment. Ms. Bradford, you have the floor now. I'll give you extra time, uh, uh, up to three minutes, please. So how might the government reduce the reliance on external resources in a relatively short period of time while a project is ongoing? Is that directed at? at that, me, yes, Mr. I was Chair? continuing my question with you. Um, well, here we were looking at the whole time between the development of uh, the, the launch of the of the Arrive Can app, which was in early 2020, all the way till uh, January of 2023. That's a few years time. So I acknowledge, given the need for. Uh, the assessment that was done by the Public Health Agency and the Canada Border Services Agency at the beginning that they didn't have the skills uh, and also the capacity at that time to do it. I would have eventually expected to see a transition in order to reduce that long-term reliance on an external vendor. Uh, aspects like maintenance of the of the application. Um, and what, what I think is missing here fundamentally in many of the IT contracts that we see in the public services, that acknowledgement that there needs to be a transfer of knowledge or skills at some point isn't there. Um, and so, you know, over-dependence or reliance on a third party is created when uh, the, the public service isn't looking to help transition and upskill the public service, service itself. So finally, can you point to examples of best practices of a government increasing internal capacity for an ongoing outsourced project? I, I'm not sure that I could speak to a best practice. I, I think it was very reasonable at the beginning of the pandemic to recognize that there was surge capacity that was needed. There was so much going on if we put ourselves back to early 2020 uh, that it was reasonable to go to a, ven- a third party vendor, uh, especially if the skills didn't exist. Um, however, o- over a course of a few years, I would have then expected to see uh, a rebalancing of those efforts between the public service and um, um, the uh, the contractor. And I believe Mr. Hayes would like to add something if you uh, allow Mr. Chair a few minutes. Thank you. The example that I, w- I would give is, uh, is actually not our own, but it's the one from the chief in information officer who is departing the public service, I believe, 
and has now returned. Uh, she appeared before the committee in December talking about the importance of relying on external uh, resources for transformation purposes, but that is not a, a long-term solution. Ultimately, the public service needs to then take over on the transformation. Thank you. Hold well on, Ms. Bradford, you do have 30 seconds. No, uh, okay. I finished my questions. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, if, if, Thank you, Ms. Hogan and your officials from the Office of the Auditor General and Ms. Jeffrey and officials from Public Health Agency of Canada for your testimony today and participation in this, uh, in this study. Um, appreciate you all coming in on a, on, on a recess and making yourselves available to the committee. Uh, the committee will be meeting uh, again tomorrow. Um, I, I will address uh, one issue. Um, the Parliament and committees can only meet so often during the course of the week because we allow virtual Parliament, which was a decision uh, by Parliament. This allowed members to zoom in like they have today on recess weeks. It also means that my time is limited when Parliament sits because I need to seek resources, which are often not available, it seems, to opposition-led committee, but often are to government-led committee. I'll leave that for others to decide why that is. I chose to call a meeting today. I think it's been a productive meeting. Uh, not only do we get through all our witnesses in the time, we also passed an emotion that will feed into another joint study that this committee is looking at. We are meeting tomorrow. Uh, if, meeting, if members are concerned about not having enough meetings, uh, I can schedule another one. I don't think that's necessary, though. But I will say I often hear from members that this committee both is doing too little and too much. Go faster, uh, but at the same time, go slower. So on that, I adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much.